Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Jimmy Dore Show. I have a special guest with us, Peter Lavelle. He's an American journalist living in Moscow and the co and the host of Crosstalk on RT International. He was a Fulbright Fellow in Poland and has worked as a lecturer at the University of Warsaw, a market researcher and an investment analyst. He's here for us right now. Welcome, Peter. Thanks for being our guest. It's fantastic to be with you. Happy New Year to you all. Oh, Happy New Year to you. Now, let me just, can I just ask very quickly your personal journey? How did you become an American journalist living in Moscow working for RT International? Okay, I'm going to try to condense this as much as I possibly can. Um, when I was a full, I was uh, doing um, uh, uh, doctoral research when I was uh, on a Fulbright in Poland. Um, the job prospects in academia were so bleak. Uh, believe it or not, they were even bleak. Uh, they were uh, bleak 20 years ago. They're worse now. Um, and I decided to stay on in Poland, and um, I got a job in investment bank. I mean, compared to academia, that was a walk in the park. You don't have to be all that smart. Uh, to do well, you know, it, it's it's a completely fraudulent industry. Okay, you don't have to be smart to make money in finance. Um, and I was working for an international firm uh, in Warsaw, and my boss was an American. He moved to Moscow, worked for a major um, uh, Russian bank, and he kept enticing me. And I was, you know, for the first you know, thirty-five years of my life, I lived poor. I was an academic. And he was enticing me with money that I could never. I, I, uh, this is a once in a lifetime chance. I, I, I lived in Poland for a long time. I was actually quite Russophobic, to be honest with you. And I, I came here. Uh, then there was a financial crisis. The bank did give me a severance package. Uh, I was able to stay. Uh, and then I worked for a small Russian in, in investment house. I uh, was quite disenchanted with that. And then I started writing, just freelance, not even asking for money, just my kind of observations because Western media coverage of the country I was living in, this country now, living in Moscow, was just so off, I mean, so skewed, that I just started kind of, it was a corrective, and it was something I thought it was kind of a public service. And then I started doing it more and more and started getting paid for it and started making a living, not easy, but, you know, I was doing it. And then um, one of the biggest problems for someone that was in that position is that how do you stay in this country? Because you need to have, you know, working papers. You have to have a visa. And at that time, the, the immigration people were saying, well, you know, you're kind of like a tourist, but you're kind of working here and we need to get you on one track or another. And then the Russian information in, uh, agency called no Novosti, they, they asked me, uh, well, they, I applied for a job there because primarily it would give me a visa. It would pay for the visa and I would be here legally. And then I worked for them for a little while, and then RT International started. It was called Russia Today then. And um, interestingly enough, the topic they wanted me to talk about was FARA and, and, and foreign agents, um, because there was a article. There was at that time there was an NGO law passed here in Russia, and everyone's in the West is like, "Oh, this is terrible! It's trampling on freedom." And I pointed out on air, and I said, "Well, you know, if you kind of look at the the American document from 1938, and you look at the Russian document from 2005, they're almost duplicates." Mm -hmm. duplicates. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I mean, it, it, this is normal. This is what all Western countries do. Russia finally is catching up and doing it itself. So this is nothing extraordinary. It's actually banal. It was more or less the same thing. So, so, so you and, were asked. That, that's, that's a, and from that point on, I just, I've never looked back. I mean, all, all I do is keep looking at the hypocrisy of things. Go ahead. Like you guys do all the time. So, I'm surprised at the ubiquitousness of the modern day Red Scare. Even Internet uh, progressive news shows are going along with the CIA, the FBI and the oligarchs. And it's overwhelming to me because, you know, during the uh, run up to the Iraq war, um, the establishment media was again uh, in unison, but. It, there was a million people in the streets. There's no million people in the streets pushing back against this. In fact, uh, if you if you speak up against it, you have a million people smearing you. And it's yeah. you know it comes from the Washington Post. It comes from MSNBC. It's it. I'm actually scared by it. So um, I guess two questions: Are you surprised by the ubiquitous of it, and does it scare you? Um. Yes, I'm surprised by the level and intensity of it because, 
if we want to use the term Russiagate, it's a conspiracy without a crime. So I'm still waiting to see what the the big deal was. I mean, you know, let's remind our, our, our viewers here, you know, Watergate started because James McCord, one of the plumbers, when they broke into the DNC, he went to Judge Scalia, um, uh, he went to the federal judge that sentenced him, and uh, he, he gave the judge a letter saying people during this trial, the plumbers, that the media called them, people have perjured themselves. And the judge said this is evidence. And that was the origins of the Watergate. They, was, they started from a crime. Here, I'm still waiting for whatever crime was committed, but we've had 18 months of this ridiculous um, immediate scapegoating of people. Just like you said, if you, if you dissent at all, you're tarred and feathered and your, 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 your careers can be destroyed. I mean, I'm already dead for them. So actually that's kind of a freedom I have. Okay, I mean, I, I work at RT, um, I'm very outspoken. I'm not afraid of anyone. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm more afraid for journalism in the United States because I think it's been so corrosive over the last, I mean, not, you know, it's been in a bad uh, state for a while, but over the last 18 months, um, I, 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 there's, I, it's the age of disbelief and it's the media that has done this. And they're the ones that elected Donald Trump. The media did. So, but yeah, I, I thought it was Susan Sarandon and Jill Stein. In, you know, the all, the all <laughs> yeah. powerful, the all powerful. You know, you know, Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that's exactly right. Um, but it's the progressives that they're going after now because uh, the Trump people, they've already been tarred and feathered. They've already been outed and all of that. Um, I think they're less and less concerned with them because the media has already convinced people without any facts whatsoever. These narratives are accepted as truth. And now the strategy is to destroy the, the, the progressive, not, and it's already been quite damaged, um, to go after progressives, going after Jill Stein. I mean, that is really a wake-up call, a really wake-up call. It's because she dared to have an opinion. She dared to run for office. It is her constitutional right. That is really quite terrifying. And it shows to me that they have this game plan, and they're using Google, YouTube, uh, Instagram, Facebook, they're going after any kind of dissent, and it's dissent on the left, not dissent on the right. Well, of course, it's not dissent of. It's of course it's not. <laughs> yeah, there's no. Well, there is dissent on the right. I mean, I'm, as someone like myself, I'm. Uh, I look at Pat Buchanan as someone that I like when it comes to foreign policy. A uh, Ron Paul. Uh, is a libertarian on foreign policy. I think that, you know, there are smart people, progressives, and there are a very small number of liberals. You have conservatives, paleocons, you can call it that, that are, uh, uh, I actually listened to Donald Trump during the election because, the campaign, because he said things about foreign policy that I agreed with. I agreed with very strongly. And you can imagine my disappointment. It was that, that one element there that I thought, they, that is a corrective there. And of course, we've all been proven um, that he, we were proven wrong to believe any kind of rhetoric like that. So why do you think there was such a uh, friction between the Trump administration and the CIA, the intel, the intelligence community, right? It seems like he's going right along with doing their bidding. Was it just because he wouldn't do it in Syria? Well, you know, the, 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 uh, on my program, Crosstalk, I've talked to a number of experts about that. Yes, he's going along, but he's not getting any dividends for it. He's not getting anything for it. I and know. this is what's really quite quite interesting, because they're still going to go after him, all right? They're still going to obstruct. He can't. He doesn't have control over his own DOJ. Uh, he's given away any kind of um, uh, uh, authority that he has for himself to the, to the, uh, to the Defense Department. Uh, the CIA... Well, you know, when he bombed Syria, oh, it was very interesting. Look at the picture they put out for the media. All defense people, there wasn't anyone from the intelligence community there. Not one person. It's a very interesting fact. I don't think anyone from the State Department was there either. Um, you know, so what's the it, it significance seems, of that? He's given, away, he's given away a lot of things, but he's not getting anything in return. Okay, that, If that's the art of the deal, no deal for me. So why do you think that is? Why do you think he's not getting anything back if he's doing the bidding of the establishment and the intelligence community? If they think that they can tame him, but still get rid of him. No, they, I don't see them accepting him. I, I, I don't. Um, and 
we have to really seriously wonder what kind of intelligence reports he's being given to make these kinds of decisions. All right. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, if you look at all of this, uh, the real collusion, the real collusion in the 2016 election was in the D Department of Justice. I mean, if you look at what's been coming out, I mean, they were going to do everything before and after the election to derail the, the constitutional outcome of the uh, of the electorate. OK, I mean, I have to be agnostic and my position is very clear and I do not deviate from it. He was elected under the system that we have, like it or not, he is there. If you want to remove him and I'm agnostic about his personal fate, you better make it legal because you're destroying institutions left and right. The media is going along with it. You better be careful what you wish for, because if you make the standard political behavior of uh, 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 the federal government is regime change, if you don't like the guy, you're going to truly regret it. And that's one of the definitions of a, a banana republic. So everybody better be careful about what they do. If, P if Trump is going to be impeached, it should be done constitutionally and legally. And otherwise, you endanger all those institutions and the belief people have in democracy at all. And of course, I have no belief in, uh, in trust in, in the mainstream media whatsoever. So what do you think America needs to know about RT? Well, I mean, if you look at RT, I mean, look, I can talk about RT International because this is where I work. I'm one of the only uh, conservative voices there. Most of the people, the foreigners that there are, are, are kind of mainstream, if not liberal. Let's look at RT America. It's a very liberal place. I think you've been on the program with Jesse Ventura and you know some of the people there. Um, I think it's fair to say that they're left progressive, um, uh, almost to the person. Um, and that's fine because we have diversity of broadcast. We have a, a, a pretty good diversity and I think it's pretty well balanced. Um, it's, you know, what, what I think we achieve, and I think what we're really attacked for, is that we question narratives, all kinds of narratives about uh, what kind of equality or inequality there is in the United States. Um, my um, uh, hobby horse is foreign policy and security policy about the duplicity of so much that is done in the name of the United States abroad. I mean, look at, uh, look at Iran right now. I mean, you know, we had, you know, decades that's punished the Iranian people for their regime, and now they come out in the last few days. We want to, be, we want to help the people of uh, of Iran. I mean, come on, I have a memory. These people in the media, and they just don't. And you know, the the McCainiacs in, in in the Senate. I mean, just look at their record. That's all I do. I just say, well, this is what he said in two thousand eight, and this is what he says now. That's I'm not conspiring. I'm not making anything up. I'm using the public public record. And I'll give, I'll tell you something that I always do on my program. I always cite Western sources, reliable sources, the Washington Post, the New York Times, CNN. This is what they say. I always use their sources against them. OK, so what, what I do and what a lot of people around me do is we question narratives and nothing more or nothing less. And we give people that have been shunned by the mainstream a platform to speak. But of course, they're they're being uh, intimidated. I'm not going to name names right now, but some very prominent people that have been on my program have uh, told me privately that the atmosphere here it's 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 too it's too constraining. And there's a lot of fear. It's a McCarthy like environment, and they want to lay low for a while to see where this goes. And I I always have to say, okay, I have no problem. But um, it's really sad. When do you think we will get to our "Have you no dignity, sir?" moment? When does that happen? You know, that, that's a hard question to answer because, you know, you had, you know, you had Edward R. Morrow, you know, you had somebody of stature, right. gravitas, right. that could stand up and say, and speaking for the fourth estate, saying shame on you. But I don't see that happening right now. This is the real problem. You know, if you, I don't remember the origins of it, but I was growing up during the Vietnam War as a small boy. <clears throat> and you have to remember that you had um, the uh, see, all the major uh, uh, networks then, they were very pro-war for most of it until there was a kind of a critical mass. And then were some individual voices like Walter Cronkite that said, hey, I've been there, I've seen this. What, what, the, the, what the, the Pentagon is telling us, it's simply not true, it's fabricated. And then we had the Pentagon papers to back it up. 
I don't see anyone. What um, uh, you, you think um, Jake Tapper is going to stand up? You think you know? Yeah, right, right, okay. Or that Cuomo fellow that I had a quarrel with a few years ago. Do you think he's going to stand up for the truth? None of these. Oh, what they just do is cut a paycheck. You know, they. You know, what they make in, in a month, I can't imagine making over years. Okay, I mean, nobody where I work makes a a lot of buckets of money. Okay, and not at all. Um, so I, I'm not waiting for them to, to, to stand up for the truth because they, what they're just doing is they're just the PR arm uh, for, the, for, the, for the deep state and, and, and the corporatists. That's all they do. And they're, they're lavishly, lavishly rewarded for what they do. And so, you know, I wake up in the morning and look in the mirror and feel great about myself because I am saying exactly what I think all of the time. And by virtue of my job, I actually get to speak to some really interesting people that the media shuns, okay? Important academics, people that used to be uh, very big in journalism, but nobody, they're not allowed to be heard anymore. So um, I can't answer your question, Jimmy. I wish I did, and I don't think it's going to happen for a while. I don't know how this thing is going to play out. I don't know how it's going to burn itself out. And, you know, it's like a wounded beast. I mean, uh, they're not going to react well going down. Uh, what you you mean the people pushing the McCarthy the Red Scare are yeah. not going to react well when this starts to unravel? Well, I mean it is unraveling. It's unraveling left and right. It's just not getting a lot of coverage. Okay, I mean you know you even I think it was um St it was what was the new it was actually the New York Times was actually saying that you know some of these narratives are I mean okay it get you know we we get the the investigation uh, into Trump over Russian collusion is based on a fake dossier and George Papadopoulos having a drunkard conversation with an, an Australian diplomat <laughs> I mean you, you can't even make this stuff up okay and, and and so you know it, it is coming out right now. I guess what's really going to be interesting is Mueller's report, and and and, and will people believe it? Will it have credibility? And it, it seems to me that you know you have uh, George Papadopoulos, a young guy that uh, misspoke, and you know, he you know he was trying he, he was trying to impress, and he didn't do a very good job of it, and he ruined his career by lying to the FBI. And then you have Paul Manafort, which is. I mean, if you look at this guy's history, I mean, this guy's a pretty dodgy character. I mean, you know, he's he's all over in Ukraine. And I'd like to point out to uh, our viewers here, because it almost never gets any airtime. Paul Manafort was working for um, the, the Yunukovych government before it was overthrown illegally in, in, in February 2014. Yunukovych was trying to get into a European association agreement, something the Russians didn't particularly like, okay? So you have this, you know, they always say this pro-Russian president. Well, no, he wasn't pro-Russian. He was, he was defending his oligarchic clan behind him because his clan, mostly in the East and the Donbass, um, that is under siege right now by the Kiev government, these oligarchs, they wanted to clean their money. And they said to Yunukovych, you run our clan. Now make a deal with the Europeans because we want to clean our money. That is the origins of what Paul Manafort was doing in Ukraine, okay? Selling a deal so the oligarchs could to clean their filthy money from the, the eastern part of Ukraine. So next time you hear something, like Yunukovych, the pro-Russian president, it's it's garbage. It has there's no basis in truth in it whatsoever. And I know Ukrainian politics pretty damn well. Okay, so uh, I've certainly said that on this show that the, he was pro-Russian because um, that's how it's been reported everywhere. This is the first time I've ever heard the opposite. No, but I'm just, but it, it doesn't make any logical sense. Why was the president of Ukraine involved in, in developing a European association agreement when they knew the Russians weren't happy? About it? Why weren't the Russians happy about it? I'll tell you why. Because then it would be a conduit. You, you, you have you know, Ukraine would get into some kind of trading agreement with the, the European Union and then trade from the European Union would go into Ukraine and then it would seep into Russia where they wouldn't have any customs control. And the Russians are saying, look, I mean, you're going to flood the market and we won't be able to compete. We, we need to have some kind of a, a trading association agreement with them as, as well. And the Ukrainians said they didn't care. Because the, the oligarchs in the East wanted to clean their money. They don't care about the people. And so the, the Russians said, no, you, 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 you better be careful in doing that. We, you need to negotiate with us simultaneously. And the Russians asked that three different times before the coup, publicly. 
And they asked the European Union to do the same, is that they work three, uh, all three partners together and work out a deal where you wouldn't flood you know, uh, the Russian market with cheap goods from the European Union. So, I mean, there's nothing diabolical about it. It's very logical. I mean, that's what countries do, protect their borders and trade. Like What the Russians wanted was perfectly normal. No one ever says the obvious, okay? Why would be the Russians be against it, okay? The, Russia is not against the European Union. I ask people repeatedly, give me one foreign um, ministry statement where the Russian government says they're against the European Union. It doesn't exist. It's another fiction. So Paul Manafort was also working in conjunction with Tony Podesta uh, yeah. with the Ukraine government, and they were funneling... Well, Funneling. I know Paul Manafort uh, funneled a million dollars at least to Tony Podesta, and Tony Podesta also not registered uh, Farah right as a foreign agent. So he's on. A, he uh, uh, seems like he's in the same position that Paul Manafort is in. Which what this revealed to me on this show and what I told people is, it just goes to show you this whole Russia thing is a big. A uh, smokescreen, right? This is all propaganda, and that it's one big club. They all work together. All the oligarchs, they don't care who they work for or when they work for them. It's all about, you know, there's no okay. countries anymore. I mean, Tony Podesta doesn't give a shit about the United States any more than he cares about the Ukraine or Russia. He cares about money, influence, and power. Am I wrong about that? Right. Jimmy, let's, it's, you know, uh, I, I know like Fox is really pushing the Ukrainian one uh, deal, okay? And, and that's fine. Maybe there needs to be more transparency there. But well, I'll, I'll give you a simple reason. Um, if the Russians wanted to help Donald Trump, they could have easily done it through Uranium One because some of their guys were arrested by the FBI for uh, bribery and other uh, illegal activity. The uh, uh, Congress wasn't really informed about it. There was a tiny little blip about something in, in, in Western media, no real reaction. But the Russian side had all of the evidence about how, how the Clinton Foundation, the Clinton clan was working to get this deal passed. They have names, conversations, who knows what they have. And you know what? They never put it out in the public. Why? Because they didn't care who was going to win. And again, I'd like to stress to our viewers here, the Russian, the Russian political elite is extremely agnostic when it comes to American politics because, and it's been proven true, it doesn't matter who's in office, we're going to be hostile. So what's the point in trying to pick a side? And that would be very high risk. And they're not those kind, they're not risk takers. They really aren't risk takers when it comes to that. So, you know, for me, I find it just truly exhausting watching cable TV oh. talking about a myth, uh, a fanciful story that has only, it's only driven by domestic political interests, okay? And the media makes a lot of money off of it, okay? I mean, what was it, a few, a, a day or so ago, CNN had this really big special report, you know? And I, I watched like two or three minutes of it and I just thought, this is just rehashing, rehashing of nothing that has been proven. It's just opinions. Rachel and, Maddow and people, has, has risen to the top of the cable news business over this Russia gate, over being a McCarthy smear merchant, which she is. And she did a whole, <laughs> she did an hour special on a Saturday night about the dossier, a dossier which was debunked on her own show and she dismissed it. Uh, Richard Engel came on her own show and said that this I've tried to confirm everything in this dossier and these people say they have these dates, these facts. I say, OK, show them to me and no one will give me evidence. That was her own reporter on her own show. And her response to that was, well, it doesn't have to be true to, to blackmail you. That was her response. <laughs> I'm like, that's exactly the definition of black. It has to be true for it to be blackmail. Otherwise, it's just exactly. a smear. And you know what? I mean, you know, Christopher Steele, I, I really have to wonder what kind of nutcase this guy is. I mean, he has his contacts in Russia and he calls them up because I think he hasn't been here for 16 years. Right. And they you know, say, I'm going to give you some money for some dirt. And I'm sure <laughs> XKGB, current FSB said, oh, really? Oh, well, I mean, we can have a conversation here. Yes. And then and then. Christopher Steele, he, he goes back to dip into the well again and say, oh, you want some even more information? Well, isn't that wonderful? I mean, <coughs> this guy is, is supposed to be the, on the top of his game when it comes to Russia. They played him like a fool. And some people went to the money with uh, went to the bank with money. I mean, look, I, I looked at the dossier when it came out. I couldn't believe my eyes. I said, no, I, I, this, this 
I live here. I, I was, you know, locations, dates, names, they're all off. I mean, it, it, a lot of my Russian friends read this said, you know, did a graduate student write this? I mean, this is, this is ridiculous. It, 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 you just read it, it, it just it doesn't make any sense from the perspective where I am, where I live. And I've lived here for 20 years. So go ahead and tell me, what is the perspective? You know, I interviewed Nadia from Pussy Riot the other day, and I tried to get her to tell me what the feeling is of the average uh, Russian about what's happening right now with Trump and uh, the Red Scare inside the United States. And uh, she said there was no average Russian opinion. But in America, there certainly is about this. Most people are going along with it. So are most people, do they see it for the canard that it is in Russia, do you think? Yeah, I mean, but but I think it's more serious than that because it has foreign policy implications. Um, more and more troops, NATO troops, come up to Russia's borders. Um you have more and more drones and anti-missile defense coming up to Russia's borders. You have to, Russia has to react to that. And then, of course, you know, if Russia moves troop, troops towards its own borders inside its own country, it's called a provocation. What? It can't even move troops inside its own border? I mean, you know, I mean, for Russians, you know, it's in some ways it's kind of slightly amusing as in like, our, my country, my president did this to their country, great, powerful, democratic America. And they're running around, you know, with the, and afraid to turn off the lights at night and they check under their bed before they go to sleep. I mean, we did that. So it's kind of whimsical that way. But then, you know, when troops come up to your border, that's nothing to the smear at. I mean, that's very serious and you have to take security very serious. Considering what the United States has done, I, um, you know, with Af how many countries can we name here? Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia, Yemen, Ukraine, well, Syria. Well, you, know, you, have, you take this stuff seriously. My suggestion is for the United States to invite Russia into NATO, and that would fix everything, right? Well, um, actually, um, there was uh, talk of that earlier uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed um, after uh, Gorbachev has promised that NATO would not move one inch east uh, beyond uh, uh, unified Germany. Um, and so they broke their word again and again and again. Um, they, the U.S. left the anti-ballistic missile treaty in, uh, I think it was 2002, and one of the pillars of arms control. Um, no, I mean... Um, they don't want, I mean, they would let Russia into NATO if it would act like Poland. Right. So they're, they're not interested in that. They're not, because they have their own security. They have a different neighborhood. They have vast borders. Um, no, I mean, Russia says, why would we do that? What's in our national interest? So so Washington can determine our foreign policy, because what foreign policy does, you, uh, does uh, Poland have? What kind of foreign policy does Romania have? If you don't behave, you're going to get in trouble. And, the, and look at Hungary and Poland, and they already learned that, okay? I told those two people from those two countries, don't join these organizations. You're joining as uh, from a weak standing. You have to be able to go into these clubs with something to give so you can get something back. And they made that mistake. And now I told them you're going to go from uh, the tutelage from Moscow to Brussels and Berlin. Go ahead. They'll take your culture away from you and other things, okay, so in their religion. So, you know, um, now th th there's a lack of trust here. The Russians don't trust the Americans. They watch what they do around the world all the time. I mean, how do you think uh, 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 Sergei Lavrov dealing with John Kerry? I mean, he must think John Kerry must have been schizophrenic. When they're in a conference room together, they all nod, and then he goes to the airport, and then we hear tweets, and then by the time he's in the United States, John Kerry is saying something completely different. He changed his tune on Syria so many times. How do you take someone like that seriously? I, you know, yes, I know. John John Kerry has spoken out of both sides of his mouth on Syria. We reported here he's done the same thing about Israel. Well, he he will admit that it's an apartheid state privately, and then when it's asked about publicly, he did not. So yes, John Kerry, he he is such a uh, a mystery. How. You can become, uh, you know, introduce yourself into public life by being an anti-war activist and then be becoming one of the biggest warmongers in the history of the world. Okay, <laughs> and, look, and look what they're doing with Iran right now. I mean, haven't we seen this playbook yes. before? Yugoslavia, we had Ukraine, and they tried it on Russia, it didn't uh, succeed. Uh, they've done it a number of times with Iran. I mean, you know, get at least a little bit more imaginative, okay? I mean, it's breathtaking watching this ridiculous propaganda about Iran, 
Okay, and, and and then you know this whole thing with Jerusalem, and then you know we have a reformist in Wahhabi Saudi uh, Saudi Arabia. I mean, I, it, it's dizzying. I mean, it, it, and this is what they report, and this is it's it's breathtaking. Uh, Norway announced today they're going to finally stop uh, f- giving arms to the United Arab Emirates because of what they're doing in Yemen. I was like, wow, it only took you two years to figure out you should stop doing that. Anyway, listen, we no, have. If, is, go ahead. No, I'm just going to tell you that I make it a point on my program to keep mentioning Yemen because I think it is so shameful that this this uh, humanitarian catastrophe is just completely whitewashed. They rather talk about. Trump's two scoops of ice cream and a white van in front of him playing golf. It's shameless. I agree. Um, That's why I have a show, because of how poorly the establishment media reports the news. And it was through the Bernie Sanders campaign that progressives uh, couldn't deny it anymore. They saw it, right? So we lived through the Iraq war. We lived through the economic meltdown where no one was punished except we balanced the budget back and we brought the banks back on the back of the poorest people in the country. We kicked 5.1 million families out of their houses so people like Lloyd, Lloyd Blankfein could be rich and Steve Mnuchin could run a bank. So uh, people have seen through it. That's why we have a show uh, is because of uh, places like that. But they're trying to get rid of our show now. So... Uh, uh, they're doing everything they can. They're having algorithms that uh, d- that keep our show away from people and prop up establishment news media. They've demonetized us. It's uh, you know, so it's not certainly as bad as RT America. I know you're RT International, but uh, they've done they've been doing everything they can to us. But we're not stopping. Listen, I don't want to be part of their club. And that's, I think, why I get to uh, I, I want to make fun of Jake Tapper and Rachel Maddow and Chris Hayes and The Washington Post. And, uh, you know, The Washington Post, their owner is the biggest predatory capitalist in the world. You think there'd be some stories to write about that guy, the richest guy in the world? Who? who uh, no, they don't. There's never a story to write about Jeff Bezos in The Washington Post. And I thought democracy dies in darkness. Anyway, we could talk all day, Peter. We're out of time. Uh, I really appreciate you taking time. Um, I, I just want to ask you, you know, you, you know, my, my final question is that, you know, you're, you are a researcher and an investment analyst. We haven't had a recession in 10 years in the United States. So one's coming, right? Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, I, uh, uh one thing that I can tell you maybe an, uh, value added comment is that, uh, um, uh, governments like Russia have made sure that they're not going to get caught into it. They, you know, um, uh, um, what was it? Uh, the, the Russia was deeply invested in some of these financial institutions in 2008, and they got really burned. Um, uh, anyway, quantitative uh, easing. I mean, <laughs> you know, you're just pumping it into a tire that already is uh, has so many holes in it. Okay, it's it's good. It's going to collapse. I mean, and this is one of the reasons why people are so interested in in Bitcoin and these other currencies because. Uh, I don't have a lot of faith in it a, a, at all. I mean, and considering I don't know, you're closer to it, but this this tax plan. I mean, reinventing the the, the Reagan tax plan. I, I'm I I'm not can you know I'm not a, 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 as close to it as you are, but I have a hard time believing that. You know, I've always believed that if if you have a, a lot of money and you're rich, you're going to buy a Ferrari and you're not going to hire people. You're going to buy art. And you're going to buy a yacht. Maybe that does a few people gives few people uh, jobs, but you know. Um, they're, 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 people are not like that. Um, and we've seen the kind of predatory capitalism, particularly since uh, um, um, 2008. I mean, th- these people have no humanity whatsoever. So, I mean, I, 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 the, an economic collapse, it's just to what degree? I mean, seriously. And the, um, you have a number of countries in the world, and it's, again, underreported. Um, uh, Russia and China are trading in their own currencies. Um, Russia is m- making e- all kinds of efforts. So is China, um, uh, other countries uh, like Brazil, the other uh, India. Uh, they're they're getting people to trade in their own currencies. That is the worst thing that's going to happen because once that happens, once there's a critical mass, all of those trillions of dollars in the in the world, they're going to flood right back into the United States. That will be a a very very um, uh, depre- uh, literally a depressing moment because you'll have hyperinflation. So, I mean, that's good. I, I don't look at, you know, uh, those are the kind of inter- indicators I look at, how much uh, countries are getting away from the U.S. dollar. And once it gets to a certain point when the dollar is not uh, a top dog anymore, it has no place to go but to back home. So 
So you're saying that when countries start to trade with their own currency instead of, well, like we talk about the petrodollar on the show. Yeah. And yeah. that people, if they want to buy oil, they have to first uh, convert their currency to dollars, right? Right. And so do you see an end to that? Yeah, I do. Um, well, with the petrodollar, that's good. That's good. Uh, it depends on the in the uh, on the uh, um, the Gulf Council countries. I mean, how much they're going to stay with it. But I mean, their political stability is quite tenuous. Okay, I mean this this crown prince, this oh this guy. Um, <clears throat> I mean, Stalin would be proud of this guy. Um, no, it, it, it's it's you know what's happened is really interesting. Is that it's a, it's an academic thing called the world uh, without the West, and what we're ha what we're seeing, and what and the West doesn't see it, particularly the Americans, because they're so focused on themselves. And media, they're just too dumb; they're not smart enough to understand this. Is that other countries are building their own institutions, their own IMF, their own World Bank, and there's no and there's very few political um, uh, demands that like the IMF always puts on the conditionality, and this is happening. It's and it's gaining pace. And as the as uh, CNN is obsessed with, you know, um, uh, Trump drinking 12 uh, diet uh, Cokes, the rest of the world is actually moving on. The U.S. is beginning to look so irrelevant to people because it's not a serious place. And and, and, and what happens with what the American media and elites don't understand or don't care is that the world actually is watching them very closely and they're beginning to really strongly doubt. I mean, look at the Europeans. The Europeans are furious why is Trump giving lethal aid to Ukraine? Why? What 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 political geo, uh, geopolitical interest does the United States have in Ukraine? Europe is right next to Ukraine, and Ukraine is right next to Russia, and they have a cold, uh, frozen conflict in the Donbass. Why are the Americans uh, 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 warming up that conflict? More people are going to die. The Amer the, um, the Europeans are getting more and more disillusioned. I mean, you know, Trump is going to destroy NATO. I guess he will. Okay. I mean, I mean. They just don't look at the implications of all of these things because other countries, believe them or not, they believe that they have at least some sovereignty left. And when it comes to security, you know, if you're in, if you're in Eastern Europe and you see more and more American troops going in there, you're going to think you're less safe, not more safe. Yeah. Wow. Well, we could talk all day, as I said before, Peter Lavelle from Crosstalk on RT International. Thank you for being our guest, and I hope you come back soon. I will. Thank you very much, and Happy New Year's to all you guys. Okay, Happy New Year.